Yahweh is the king. God is the king. That's it. Nobody else. I've been chewing on this lesson for, for a hot minute. You know what I'm saying? And, and I, I really feel like it's important that we really just go back to the gospel at its rawest form. Don't get it twisted. See, growing up, I, I kicked it with a lot of small homies, right? And so we, we would like, we'd go play basketball and Castle's like, oh, I'm finna shake Coleman, I'm fixing to cross Coleman over. And I'd be like, no, nah, brother, don't get it twisted. You know what I'm saying? I can hold my own. And, and so that's what I wanted to, to title this sermon tonight, is don't get it twisted. We live in a culture, a society, this Western culture, where a lot of people twist truth to make it fit their agenda. E even some Christians. And it is not good. There's nothing cool about that. And so my heart is burdened that, that we, um, as, as college students here at Texas Tech Raider Nation, that we would rep a, rep a God who is legit, not one that is twisted. Because ultimately what separates us from the world, if we're not repping the true gospel, the, the gospel, the good news that calls us to action, right? What's the difference? What's the difference if we look the same? Especially in Lubbock, Texas, everybody considers themselves a Christian. And so Galatians 1 I got reading that passage, I was like, man, Paul is, Paul is for real. And, and, and like his letter, his letter to the churches in Galatia is real serious. All the way to the end. And, and the thing that I need you to understand is that this letter, because God's word is living and active, is for you tonight. We're just, we just going to go through the first 12 verses. And, and I want you to take it personally. I don't want you to look at this as like all oh, Coleman is sharing this. No, take this personally. Just because I know the Lord wants to have an encounter with each and every one of you tonight. So uh, before, before we hop into text, man, I want to give you some, just some context of what's going on and why Paul wrote Galatians 1. Some important things in regards to why Paul wrote to the churches in Galatians. Paul wrote the letter to the people of Galatians to, count, uh, to counter Judaizing false teachers who were undermining the central New Testament doctrine of justification by faith. They were spreading dangerous teaching that Gentiles must first become Jewish proselytes and submit to all Mosaic law before they can become Christians. Paul was shocked by the Galatians' openness to that heresy. Like, Paul was like, what? He wrote to the letter to defend justification by faith and to warn the churches of banning the essential doctrine. So as Paul went to, to, to Galatia to, to do mission work, to, to teach the gospel, they took it, they accepted it, and then there was, there was other false teachers that came in eventually and started bringing in another type of doctrine. And, and the bad thing about it is, is a, lot of, a lot of these believers were open to it. Somehow Paul caught wind of it. It's like, man, I got to write them. I got to share my heart. And so here's where we are. Galatians 1. Remember, this is to you tonight. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Event, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than, one, than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't get it twisted. Envision this. God the Father, creator of the universe, chilling, posted up with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They go in and start creating. God doing it just by speaking it to existence. That's what's up. And then, like, we get to Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and, and God is like, let us make man in our own image. That's a big deal. That's a privilege. So ultimately, we were created to reflect God's glory. That's it. We were created in his own image. What a sweet privilege. That's something that you need to take ownership tonight. Because we were created in God's own image. That's not just a cute fairy tale story. So then we get down to Genesis 2. And God gives Adam and Eve a commandment, right? Says, yo, you can eat from anywhere in this garden. But you can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when you eat from it, you will surely die. Period. The cool thing about that in Genesis 2 is it wasn't a suggestion. It was a commandment. And, and not only was it a commandment, but it was set up for their protection, their satisfaction, their enjoyment, their fulfillment. They had everything that they needed in that garden. That's a big deal. What else? What else? What more could they have needed? Picture this. What more could they have needed? I mean, from the get-go, they were already created in God's own image. And then we get to Genesis 3. And the serpent is, it makes its way to Eve. And, and before I hop in, in Genesis 3, John 10, 10, the first part, says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes, God has a plan for your life, a specific plan for your life, and that's to glorify him in everything you do and to reflect his glory. But on the flip side of that, Satan does have a plan for your life. Satan does have a plan for your life. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. So in other words, sin doesn't come to be your best friend. Sin doesn't want to see you be the best person you can be. Sin doesn't want to see you meet your significant other. 
As a matter of fact, sin wants to keep you so divided from anything that has to do with God's goodness. Satan has a plan for your life. Peep game. Genesis 3. The serpent approaches Eve and asks the the all-time cunning question. Did God really say, did God really say that you can't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? His plan is already in effect right here. And he was like, yo, God said that we can eat from anywhere in the garden. But he did say that we cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you do, then you will certainly die. The serpent was like, no, you will certainly not die. As a matter of fact, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Hey, Satan tripping because... What, that, that doesn't make sense because in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our own image. So, so what, what, what do we need to look like God for if we're already created in his own image? This is a big deal right here. So Eve looks at the tree. See that it looks good. It's appealing good for wisdom, takes some fruit, bites, right? And then she hands it to Adam, and he took a, takes a bite, and then boom, sin has entered into the world. And, and, and by their actions, they said that God wasn't enough. They didn't trust God. Eve taking that fruit and and biting it, she was saying that God wasn't enough. She disobeyed the commandment that God had set up for her and Adam that was ultimately set up for greatness. Like that was not set up for punishment. And long story short, sin is here now. And it's nasty and it's disgusting. And everybody's born into a, a, a disgusting, sinful nature. And to make matters worse, we got kicked out of the garden. Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, which is symbolic to them being kicked out of God's presence. And to make matters even worse, they couldn't eat from the tree of life anymore which is symbolic to them being in a covenantal relationship with God the Father. They couldn't eat from the tree of life no more. See, what we need to understand is that that isn't tight. That's real. So what that means is from that point, their souls were dead. And, And everybody that is born into this world is born into this world as a sinner who is lost and separated from the creator of the universe. We're dead. The Bible describes us as children of wrath, sons of abomination. In Romans, it talks about our flesh is hostile to God. Oh, I spit, man. That's crazy. (laughs) Mickey, it's going to catch you in a minute, bro. (laughs) Our flesh is hostile to God. So we got beef with God. And to make matters even worse, we can't do anything about it. We can't do nothing about it. Picture this. You, specifically, in an ocean full of sin, floating with your head, with your face first in, dead, That's it. That is horrible news. That's what sin has done. But thanks be to God and his love, his unconditional love for humanity. 
that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, be faced with the same type of temptations that we were or are. And not only to live a perfect life, but to take the penalty for what we as humans deserve. Death. I think Romans 6, the first part of that verse, Romans 6, 23, I think. For the wages of sin is death. That's it. So Jesus took the penalty for our sins. Something that we deserve. God showed his grace. Something that we didn't deserve. And Jesus took that took that nasty punishment, the worst punishment in the world, especially back in the first century. He took it with all of us on his mind. And things just got even more swag-tastic. He rose three days later, resurrected like a grown man, and defeated death. That's a big deal for the sake of us being reunited back to the Father, God the Father. Some call it the beautiful exchange. That's good news. But back to the fact that we could do nothing to save ourselves. So while we're laying face first in that ocean of sin, floating, God reaches down, picks us up, and breathes life back into us. And, and, and it gets even cooler. Not only does he breathe life back into us and awaken our soul, he holds us tightly in his hand. Because his love is unconditional. Because we fall short day in and day out. The Bible says all fall short of the glory of God. And so I, I'm reminded of that song that says, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never gives out on me. That's all I can think of, of when he's holding you and me in his hand, saying, I got you. And the thing that we need to realize is it wasn't by works that that happened. And that's beautiful. Because these Judaizers in Galatians 1 add that element. And, and, and they expected the churches in Galatia to uphold these Mosaic laws before they could become a Christian. But New Testament doctrine says that Christ died for all, once for all. There's nothing we can do. His grace is that sufficient, that adequate. And that's what's up. That's good news. So back to verse 1. Paul, an apostle, said not from men, nor by a man but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. See, from the get-go, Paul is establishing his identity in this letter. He's like, hey, hey, brother, I don't belong to you. No one on earth gave me this status as an apostle. It was given to me by God through Christ who snatched me while I was on the road to Damascus. My mind not even on God. And that's something that I want to remind you. It's like, hey, if you're a believer tonight, you didn't do it. God did it. And that's what's up. 
You wouldn't want that type of power anyway. You couldn't handle it. I for sure couldn't handle it. So I'm thankful that, that the Lord of my life knew what he was doing. Verse 3, grace and peace to you from God. I just want to stop right there. Grace and peace to you from God. Grace. Oh, grace. Here's, here's something that we need to understand. Grace is all that we are living off of. And so if that's the case, we need to understand what grace is. Because without grace, you can't have peace. Without grace, you cannot have peace. That's why things like money, cars, sex, and clothes don't satisfy. Because they're materialistic things that God created. And those things can't give grace. Grace and peace to you from God. And we'll talk about more about grace. Yeah, we'll get in a little bit. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. We'll read that again. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present age. It's crazy, man. Age has a lot of meaning to it in the Greek, man. I, I was like, dang, that's, man, that's crazy. Age does not refer to a period of time, but an order or a system. And in particular, to the current world system ruled by Satan. Right now, that's what age is referring to in the Greek. So let me, let me read that again. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So not only did the God sent his son to rescue us, right, to pull us out of that nastiness that we couldn't pull ourselves out of. Not only did God do that, but he gets his glory forever and ever and ever. See, y'all need to realize what Paul is doing is he's setting the tone with the gospel in his rawest form, saying, hey, don't get it twisted. This is what the creator of the universe, God the Father, called you to. Here it gets crazy. And you see the tone of, of Paul right here. In verse 6, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. Grace. Grace can be defined as unmerited favor, right? Unmerited favor, something that I didn't deserve. And I like to tell cats about grace by telling them how I was a Cub Scout and Boy Scout and when I was little and all the way up to high school. And, and one of our main goals was to earn these badges called merit badges. So we'd have to build a tent or set up a fire or, or sharpen an ax to get these certain badges. But we had to earn them and we had to do it all. We had to do it all right. So so grace is defined as 
unmerited favor. <laughs> favor that you didn't earn. That's what grace is in its simplest form. Unmerited favor. Verse 6, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. See, what these Judaizers were doing is they were adding. They were adding to the gospel. And that's crazy. I, I don't know what them dudes was on back then in the first century, but I'm like, yo, I'm not finna add on to something that the, the creator of the universe already set in stone. I'm not that tough. This is serious. These Judaizers were trying to add other doctrine that didn't belong there. And, and what's super crazy, oh, somebody dropped something. You good? Pick it up, brother. You good? Hey, we straight. We straight, homie. So I'm reminded of how now the same thing is happening all over the world, but specifically in this Western culture. People are perverting the gospel. For some odd reason, people want to leave out the grace of Christ, just like the Judaizers were doing back then in the first century. I heard old dude was back on campus, dead. And I heard it wasn't a lot of grace. The one thing that saved us, grace. And, and then you got, you got cats like Oprah, who's like, hey, it's more than one way. No, sister, don't get it twisted. John 14, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the tree of life, right? John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give life and give it to the fullest. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Life. I love the emphasis on life. Because that's what we were ripped from in the beginning, the tree of life. And so Jesus came to be the tree of life. Again. And, and, and he came to be the second Adam. It talks about that in the book of Romans. And, and he came to do God's purpose. And that's reflect his glory. And he did that. What a beautiful example. And Paul is saying, hey, don't get it twisted. There is no other gospel. None. Verse 6, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. I think about the Mormons. A lot of their religion is based off of works. Buddhism, based off of works. Man-made religion. Man-made religion is not good enough. Because the Bible says no one is good, not one. And so this is a really big deal. It all goes back to the power of God. Divine power, right? Paul said, I wasn't sent here by men or by a man but by God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That divine power. Don't get it twisted. And that's the same thing that you're called to. 
And that's the same thing that you're called to live by. It's real easy to come to paradigm or to go to your church wherever you go and to hear the word and hear the gospel over and over again, right? And just, just chill. That's it. But that's not what the Lord calls us to as Christians. Calls us to share that good news. The Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And a beautiful part of that is here at Texas Tech. You got all the nations here. All ethnicities. You are to be on mission every day of your life for the sake of the gospel. In Corinthians, Paul says, for the love of Christ compels us. For the love of Christ. See, here's the thing. Don't get it twisted. If you have been saved by the true gospel of Christ, then you shouldn't look the same. You shouldn't act the same. You shouldn't talk the same. You shouldn't. I compare it to this. Mickey Okafor, former Texas Tech football player, last season, 2011. If we was playing tackle the man with the football, just me and him, dude's bigger than me. And I got the ball. And I stand still to take his tackle. And he come at me full speed. Bro, I'm not going to look the same. Dude big, and he rocking that purple shirt. Hey, he big. My man Kyle Struzik stood in front of a train. Take that hit. Hey, he's not going to look the same. I ain't trying to hate on you if you got hit by a train, but that's, this is what I'm saying. It's the love of Christ. If it has captured your heart, you shouldn't look the same. You shouldn't look the same. If the gospel has captivated your heart, you shouldn't act the same. For the love of Christ should compel you. In Ephesians, it talks about we were created to do good works, even though our salvation wasn't by works. We were still created with a mission. It says, we, we are, for we are God's workmanship to cre- create it to do good works. So, so let, let me tell you, if you didn't think you have a purpose, you do. You're created to do good works because you are God's workmanship. That's a privilege. It's a privilege to be called God's workmanship. See, sin will try its hardest to say, hey, you're not really worth a whole lot. And you got to do this, 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 this to earn God's favor and God's love. And, and even, even in a small thing like if I slip up in sin, which I do all the time, and I try to be guilty, extra guilty, and live in my guilt, hoping that God will be sympathetic. No, man. I was me trying to work to get his love. When in reality, his grace is sufficient. And he already died for my past, present, future sins. So why should I just try to be in his guilt? Well, because Satan will say, hey, see what you did? See what you did last night? You don't deserve, you don't deserve what God has to offer. You're not adequate enough. You probably shouldn't even go to church. You probably shouldn't even go to paradigm. You probably shouldn't read your Bible, bro. I mean, you messed up that bad. Satan's plan is to steal, kill, and destroy, separate you from the creator of the universe. Verse 8. It gets real. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. 
And a Greek word for curse is dev- means to be devoted to the destruction of, from God to, God, to be devoted to God's destruction. That's weird. Let them be devoted to God's destruction. That's what Paul said. Verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should, uh, I'm tripping, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. See, in verse 8, it's, it's more of like a, like a hypothetical situation. He said if, if we or even an angel from heaven preach, a, preach another gospel, let, us, let them be under God's curse. Like it's that serious, right? It is that serious. Well, Paul would give a hypothetical example of a hey, me or an angel from heaven. I don't care. Let them be under God's curse. Let them be devoted to God's destruction. But then in verse 9, it's personal, talking about the Judaizers. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Here's what's crazy about us as humans, and, and more specifically as believers. Even though we're believers and we're followers of Christ, and we're considered righteous because of Jesus' blood that was imputed into us, so that way we can be justified to be righteous, even though that is that, and that is the truth. We still have a tendency because of our sinful nature to forget that, to stray away from that, to reject that. So in Galatians 5, Paul says, so I say walk by the Spirit so that you won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Verse 17, for the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, and the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. These two are in conflict to keep you from doing what you want to do. If that's the case, Galatians 5, 6, 5, 16 and 17, if that's the case, then you and I need the gospel every day of our lives. This isn't a cliche. This is what we need, right? And not only, not only do we need, desperately need this, but we should desperately want to share it to the world around us. What for? Because people were born into this world as sinners. And they desperately need a savior. Because sin does nothing good. And and they're not living. This is crucial. And, And so we should be super excited to share what the Lord has done for us. Each one of you has a unique story. And you should share that. But not because it's a cool fairy tale story, but because it's life changing. Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation. Bow. Power of salvation. That's real. So that's why you hear terms like live a gospel-centered life or have a gospel-centered relationship. It's because Christ has more to offer you in the world than you and the world have to offer yourselves. Verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I'll be the first to admit that I seek the approval of human beings all the time. All the time. 
And that's not good. And so, and so in a world where we as believers are called to share the good news of Christ, the gospel, the whole gospel, and we shouldn't be unashamed. I mean, we shouldn't be ashamed. And not only that, we should share the gospel in its rawest form. People need to know, like, hey, like your current circumstance is not good. We, we, hey, we as believers, man, we scared to get called judgmental these days. We, don't, we, we worry about offending somebody. Somebody at the workplace. Somebody in my classroom. For me, I'd be like, nah, look, man, I'm going to build this relationship with old dude. I'm going to love on him. And then from there, that's where I'm going to go. Which is important, but I never get to the gospel. There's a cop out. I know what I'm doing. People out there are dying and are confused and are scared and are looking for hope. Sin is so crafty that it has developed these terms like agnosticism, atheism. That's crazy. But you know what? I'm not tripping, though, because I was one before I knew the Lord. I didn't think God exists. I kind of did my own thing. I heard about him all the time. Even went to vacation Bible school to get free Kool-Aid and cookies. <laughs> I did these things. But I'm so glad that Christ captured my heart. But there's a, there's a, there's a, a pastor that I really did, and he put out this book called Christian Atheist, Craig, Craig, o, Craig Groeschel. And he defines, he defines Christian atheism as this. Believing in God, but living as if he doesn't exist. That's what Christian atheism is. And, and let's keep it 100. That's for you, James. We all deal with that. We all deal with that. We all deal with Christian atheism. Believing in God, but living as if he doesn't exist. Let, let, me, let me make Christian atheism practical to you, fellas. Christian atheism is best lived out at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're in front of your computer screen looking at pornography. Believing in God, but living as if he doesn't exist. Hey, ladies, Christian atheism and for you, it looks like dressing a certain way to get a guy's approval. Believing in God that he has fearfully and wonderfully made you, but not living as if that is really true. Don't get it twisted. You are God's workmanship, created to do good works. Am I now trying to win the approval of human, of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Hey, that's, that's black and white right there. That's, that's clear as day. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Is that real? Your relationship with God the Father, is that real? That if you're trying to win the approval of other, others around you, can you really call yourself a servant of Christ? Because ultimately what you're saying is I still got a selfish, selfish agenda. Another gospel that is not a gospel at all is being a believer and still holding on to some of your sin. That's definitely not good news. I don't know where you were at tonight. 
with your walk with the Lord. But what I do know is that, is that Paul is, is serious when he's talking to these churches in Galatia about living in the grace of Christ. Some of you have been slipping up, like me. And, and you haven't been living in the grace of Christ. Instead, you've been trying to do it on your own. And you haven't been plugged into your community because you feel trapped by your sin. Because God's love is unconditional. And he says grace to each and every one of you. You have the option to repent. Day in and day out. Repentance can't be, ju be just another ritualistic religious act. Repentance has to be authentic. And it comes from having a reverence, a, a, a healthy fear for the God the Father. See, when, when Eve took the fruit off the tree, I'm not for sure if her reverence was authentic. Because she didn't trust God in that moment. What he had to offer her and Adam wasn't good enough. And we do the same thing today. We, we indulge in sin. And, and we try to find our satisfaction in it. And it burns us every time. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. These two are in conflict with each other to keep you from doing what you want to do. Hey, this is real. John 10.10, 10, back to it. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's for real. I need, I need that. No, I, that needs to be real to you tonight. And you need to find your satisfaction in Christ alone tonight. I'm married to a super fine woman, Megan Orr. And there is plenty of times where I try to find my satisfaction in her. But it doesn't work because I was created to give God glory. And, and so... I try to fill that void with other things, and it doesn't work. So tonight, you got to get real with God. Because some of you been getting it twisted. Just like some of the, the, the churches in Galatia. They were trying to live by works. They started to live by works. They were open to that. And the beautiful thing about grace, that it, it covers your sin, as far as the east is from the west. In Romans 8, Paul also says this. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Comma. Certainly not. So grace isn't a license to keep sinning. I'm like, oh, yeah, the Lord got me. No. I mean, he does. But that's the wrong view of grace. In Romans, it also talks about how God's kindness leads us to repentance. And that comes with having a clear view of what the gospel has done. You should be so moved by what the gospel has done for you that you would want to turn away from what, you're, from what you're currently dealing with. So I'm going to have a band come back up. And man, uh, if you don't know Christ here tonight, God wants to have an encounter with you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. You may be feeling like, yo, I'm too messed up. I got to get some stuff together. No way. Because you can't. You can't. 
So you might as well come to God as you are. Because his grace is enough. And, then, and if you're a believer in here tonight, the charge for you is, are you really living in the grace of Christ? That's a question that I'm faced with as well. Paul said, I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live. The one who called you. The one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. And turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all, which is really no good news at all. There's only one way to the Father. And that's through Jesus. And that's cool though. And so tonight, man, I challenge you to, re to repent. Get real with yourself. And I also challenge you to pray for your, your friends that are unbelievers. And I also challenge you to share the gospel to the world around you. Like this is why you were brought to Raider Nation for such a time as this, where things are crazy, where gay marriage is becoming a big topic. That's a gospel in itself. Gospel, quote unquote, which is really no gospel at all. The creator of the universe knows what he's doing and everything he set up was for our good. And so just like Eve decided to, to go to the tree and take some fruit, she said, hey, God is not good enough. And, and we as humans, we say, oh, well, I want to deal with the same sex. We're saying God is not good enough. What he created was not good enough. And we know that it's not true. I'm not really trying to take some stabs, but I really am. Because Paul said, hey, I'm astonished that you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. So, hey, tonight, get real. If you need someone to talk to, I'll be up here. Or sit right in your seat and get real with God the Father, who oh so loves you. Father God, thank you so much for what you were doing. I'll be the first to admit that tonight, I'll be tempted and I'll be prone to fall short. And so I need you. I need you right now, Father God. Thank you for what you're doing, God. I ask that you would break down and smash some barriers tonight, Father God. I know you can do it. Thank you. You know my prayer.